you need voice control? So our robots um, are self-contained units. They operate whether or not you have communications. We have a console application that's primarily used to give the security officers situational awareness of where the robot is and what it's doing. Robot, cancel. Hello, oh, good. Cancel the publicity bot. They take voice commands, they do a structured command language, so they're not trying to process natural language. They're taking about three or four hundred words and stringing them together into very specific commands and then confirming those. Robot, move. Robot, move. Are you sure that you want me to move? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to move them out into the middle. This. I'm going to give up on the video feed. Okay. They handle dynamic obstacles so that in a patrol setting, if things are changing, they can react to it. No, no, no. Okay. Why don't you take command back, Louise? All right, so you also get an alert over there saying unexpected motion. Um, that's actually a critical component because if the robot is going to do long endurance jobs, tasks where, in this case, this robot is designed to do 8-hour, 10-hour, 12-hour shifts, it needs to know its own state. It can't depend on a person looking at a bunch of gauges in order to set um, understand what's going on and it has to be able to generate alerts. So we're telling it roughly where it is. We work in human scale coordinates. So when you're setting one of these robots up, we use your language for where you need the robot to be and the things that the robot is going to be able to do. So if you need to dispatch this robot to a given location, you don't worry about coordinates. You tell it something simple like go to the back door. And it says, you want me to go to the back door? And you say yes, and it goes. Or on the console, you have a list that has your terminology for your space so that you don't have to do translations while you're trying to handle an incident. The big win with a, an autonomous or a variable autonomous robot is that you don't tie up somebody every second that the robot is in operation. You give it a high-level task, it figures out how to accomplish that high-level task. During that accomplishment, in fact, Louise, why don't you um, execute Patrol Zero? So we're using a console for this to simulate a, uh, a security operations center. So she said the high-level command, execute Patrol Zero. Patrol Zero involves, oh, I think we roughly set it out over there, kind of coming up front, heading over this way, and then heading back miniature version of what might be a patrol. Um, we've been testing this robot. This is our prototype. Our production models will be out in about six months. Um, it is dynamically tracking its own position and displaying that on the screen so the operator knows where the robot is and what the robot is doing. It's scanning the environment for obstacles and it's reporting. It's also carrying a high-res camera. You can put on whatever cameras you need it acts as a mobile platform to relay that information back to the operations center. And this is important on two levels. One, it's really hard to get enough cameras in place without breaking the budget. Second is, events never occur right in front of a camera. I mean, they just don't. So what happens is, when there's an incident, you can dispatch assets directly to the location that you need them to be and it brings additional support, so it brings additional, it brings additional video. It can also be equipped with a complete sensor suite that is constantly pulling environmental atmosphere into the robot and analyzing it, checking for carbon monoxide, explosive gases, checking for uh, pretty much any, obviously smoke, fire, the rest of that. In addition, if you've got specific risks, we can build those into the sensor suite 
So if you need chemical, bio, whatever, if there's a sensor out there, we can plug it in. And it will carry that around for that entire shift so that you're doing constant monitoring of the environment. And what it's doing at this point is posing for the camera. Station two. It'll turn around and head back over here. As I said, it's doing dynamic obstacle avoidance. Um, so I'm just going to stand in front of it. Or wait, I'll jump in front of it. This is designed actually to go into the commercial sector. This is a, they have, they have budget constraints like you wouldn't believe in terms of return on investment. Because we're not talking about saving people's lives with this, although that's a concern for them as well. All right, in this case, it spotted me, and it spotted me as a person. On the screen over there is an intruder detection alert popping up. So as it's doing the patrol in the middle of the night, if it comes across a person, you want to just go ahead and release it? That's going to generate an alert, which is going to focus the attention of the security team to say there's a problem here. We can also equip it if you're using RFID tags or you're using magnetic stripes. We can equip it with those card readers so it can actually authenticate people that are allowed to be on the site without needing to have a human being step into it and correct things. And of course, you got the video feeds so you can actually see their face. Um, let's just do a quick dispatch. Um, I'll send it back over to station two. So one of the other things that's critical is while this thing is doing its patrol, this one, by the way, is our prototype, but it has logged over 140 kilometers. Um, including eight hour solid shifts with nobody touching it. You have to have dependability, you have to have reliability, and if it's going to be a force multiplier, it has to work hands free. So this is done eight hour shifts in, we use a parking garage because it's a typical situation, in a parking garage with cars coming in and out, with people going through for eight hours solid, nobody touches it. Every time it had an alert, it pops up on the screen. Every time it ran into a problem, it reported it including the time when somebody, I swear, thought the robot was going to steal his parking place. And so he passed the robot, cut in front of it, and we got an alert on the screen with a beautiful photo of this guy staring out the window directly into the camera on the robot. But when you have an event, you can simply interrupt that patrol, dispatch the robot, tell it, I need you at the loading dock, I need you at the back door, and it will bring all of those assets down to the site of the location you don't have to drive it, which means your security officers are able to deal with the incident, not deal with the mechanics of maneuvering a robot down to the site. And then once it's done with that, you simply re release it, and it will go back, well, depending on your protocols, go back to a patrol, go back and report, um, do whatever is necessary. Um, I'll bring him back over here. As I said, it operates with voice control. Um, it operates with wireless. Uh, we did a lot of testing to make sure that all the wireless floating around here wasn't getting in the way. Uh, right now we've got it echoing commands because it's a prototype and we want to make sure that we know what it's doing. It also is logging every single action that occurs. It's logging it on the robot independently. It's also sending the complete log file to the console. And if you notice those um, somewhat VCR-like controls on the bottom of the console, that means they act, right, act like a VCR. You can literally stop it, back it up, replay what the robot has seen so that if you need to understand more about what's going on, that's built directly into the console. And, okay, I, I guess at this point I've been told take questions. So, questions? What's it cost? What's it cost? Excellent question. Okay, so I told you that the, the private security is in really tight straits. They, they typically pay their people between eight and 10 bucks an hour to do a shift, which means it costs about 30 to $40,000 a year to cover a warehouse for the year. We can actually put one of these things on the ground, ready to roll for less than that $40,000 price tag. So we are not talking a $100,000 robot to go into play. This is a commercial off-the-shelf product that is incredibly, incredibly cost-effective. Oh, come on, somebody's got to have a good question. We're six minutes ahead of schedule, come on. What do you think? Where? Yes. Okay, 
So the question was, what happens when an intruder puts a hat on top of the camera, somebody sneaks up behind it? It's got its own peripheral sensors, and as you recall, when I pushed it, it said, hey, quit pushing me. I mean, that's our you know, programming late at night. You kind of get a little bit, you need something to keep going, so we put some jokes in there like that. But what that's actually doing is it's running about every 300 milliseconds a complete internal diagnostics check. And during those diagnostics checks, it's checking for unexpected motion, it's checking for camera failure, it's checking for pretty much all of that stuff. It has a complete sensor suite around it. Um, this model does not have the rear sensors on it because we've been focusing on this, but the Bredetel, which means before you get to within about 10 feet of the robot, it's already detected you. The camera is under command control from the command center independent of the robot motion. So the operator there can actually pivot that camera basically 360 degrees, can zoom, pan, tilt, all of that stuff. Um, which means that we've already got the image in the command center by the time you get the hat over the top. But really good question. The other one that's in there big on that list is what happens when somebody hits it with a baseball bat. Um, and my immediate response to that is I would much rather have them hit a $30,000 piece of equipment with a baseball bat than hit the human guard who's in there. One of the other things that we get a lot of feedback for is we can dispatch this around the corner so that before the human guard walks into an unknown situation, we've got video on the ground so that we can give them a heads up and they can know what's going on. Anything else? What's the uh, battery duration? Power? Sure. Um, this, we've got a range of batteries depending. These are designed to routinely do eight to 10 hour shifts with no battery degradation at all. So we can do that basically for a year. Um, you can push it out to about uh, 14 to 16 hours with these batteries, but it will degrade the battery a bit. On the other hand, we can put in advanced battery packs that push that limit up. And our model is much like um, a car taking it in for service. We figure about once every six months during a normal service, you're probably just going to pop the battery and replace it with a new one, and that starts the counter again from zero. So we've really designed it to fit into an existing shift type model or a full, you know, basically it's going to work like a teammate alongside a person. If they're on for eight or ten hours, the robot's on for eight or ten hours. Why is it so tall? So, you've seen a lot of robots and they're all squatty and they run around on the floor. The camera is up here for a couple of reasons. One is that it allows us to look on top of things. It allows us to look at the tops of a desk. It allows us to look at a window. It allows us to look over things. The other reason is that this is a fairly um, assertive stance for a robot. It's big, it's broad, it's hefty. It conveys to the people around it that it's serious. It's not something you have to worry about stepping on. Um, the weight on it is about 110 pounds. It's fairly massive, uh, but it's, uh, it's, really, it's really more of a, a functional reason in terms of the, the, how the robot interacts with the people that gives us this height and that breadth. It's narrow enough to go through doorways. Anything else? Yes? How does the unit manage localization? Localization, great. Um, what we do is we use, use object-based localization. Um, the sonars on the system are constantly building surface maps of the things in front of them. So much like a bat flying, you're getting the sonar returns, except it's building a picture of the surface. And it can use that to recognize landmarks like walls and doorways and it can reset its position based on that. It also has um, the, uh, a gyro inertial navigation chip in there, so it's doing a MEMS chip to track um, heading differentials, and it's running on encoders, so the encoders are giving it some drift information as well. It integrates all of those. It also keeps track of its error. Part of that service loop is that it knows when it's starting to get a little bit out of position, and it can schedule on its own. I'm gonna go to a landmark, I'm gonna localize, and then I'm gonna go back to work. And I'm done. Time's up. Thank you very much.